Peace. The hip hop writer is a creator, composing understanding words of culture brilliance, powering a rebalance of the elements equally. Pages of rejuvenated reaffirmation. Simply the almighty leadership of insightful craft work that stands to build through any confrontation born to be. Yet his daily duty is as a journalist that questions properly, uses his ears for the good to filter the real, and as the art decays, by dilution he concentrates the best again and again, exposing it in the print. Today's journalist and tomorrow's historian, he listens to share. Here is that necessary attempt executed again and again and again. Peace, this is Sunya Zala, your host from PremierHipHop.com and DJ Toshi's Classic Storm Radio. We're in the 200s. This is 200 plus. I have no idea what episode we're in. Right? 204, 5. Well, we'll find out when we see it out there. But um, there's a couple of issues. And since we're doing hip hop, really a once considered lowly art form for lowly people, and it still continues to be, um, I want to bring up some issues of importance before we continue, kind of to justify our return here. The news flash of the day is that Puerto Rico is still a colony. So when that PROMESA bill passes and the Fiscal Control Board officially takes over the government of Puerto Rico, um, all you people that told me it wasn't and they had free speech and free uh, government and were American citizens will tell me otherwise. But um, if you're tired of beats and if you're tired of rhymes, if that ever happens, due to knowledge though to the oppression that all these MCs keep talking about, the suffrage and the, the hell, and the uh, issues. But this isn't the last that we're building that. Over the weekend, this last week, last Saturday was the uh, Low Life Barbecue. Me as Sunni Zala, some people know me as Skill Straight Low, Power Right. Um, we had the Low Life Barbecue up in um, Highland Park in Medina, Brooklyn. And um, I just want to salute Thurston Howell III. You know, he's the one that named me Skill Straight. Owens Malone, and of course, so the brother who gave me my L's, Rakim, Supreme Shabazzala, aka the original Rudy Lowe. Uh, it was a great time up there, meeting brothers, seeing brothers I know for years, Spit Gems, F.U., um, man, Life of Law, and everybody, man. Sha Shabam Shadiq, you know, yeah, he was there, yeah. Um, man, the God Sadat X, peace to the God. You know, everybody was up there, so it was great to see all these low lives and all these brothers that have embraced me as family, as I. Part of this extended family I've been um, honored to be part of. Um, and do the analysis of that though. The New York Times and all these people are catching up. And there's a coffee table book out now called Bury Me with the Low On. And uh, because I'm a journalist, I gotta correct. Uh, I gotta correct the journalist uh, that wrote the article. Um, Bury Me with the Low On is not a phrase that Thurston Howell made up. That's a Raekwon line, right? But. Um, you know, I'm a we're journalist, real journalists. We listen to the fucking music, right? We have great guests here, and we we'll actually listen to the fucking album, right? But um, another, the third part of importance. Um, this week, um, so not this week, but last since we last were on the air, DJ Toshi, I was with you. Um, one of the reasons why we even get to do this was had their debut back again, and that's Stretch and Bobito. Um, me being a Boricua who's a writer and then did radio. I only did radio because he's supposed to, right? I thought Bobito did it, right? So it's just, you know, what I'm supposed to do. And um, man, what a humble, righteous brother. Um, you know, you could walk up to him and give him your salute as I did years, years ago. And he's just really cool. And um, that's why I call him Cool Bob Love, right? Um, I don't think anything I ever do on radio was be as fun and and it's exciting, but whatever I'm doing on radio, um, I do it in, in, in homage to do it as important as Stretch and Bobito have done it and now are doing it again. So look that up on SoundCloud too. You know, after you listen to Toshi, go look up Stretch and Bobito's um, new show. But um, the other issue of the week though was, I don't know, kind of mediocre battle songs, but it's the points that were driven home. Um, Diabolic and Talib Kweli were getting at each other and some other MCs were thrown in the mix like my brother Immortal Technique, right? Brother Poison Pen um, and some other people. But um, I wasn't there when the beef started with Remedy and, and um, Talib Kweli, meaning I wasn't on Twitter looking at the shit. 
But I was looking at it when Diabolic came in. Actually, I was on Twitter at the time. And for the life of me, I couldn't find anything that Kwali said that wasn't correct. And that's more of where my issue is going today. And it leads into my guests, though, who have nothing to do with the issue other than they're white. And they kind of don't deal with the issue because they actually make great hip-hop. So, man, they're out of the issue, technically. You know what I mean? But um, I just wanted to read this definition and give like a two-sentence thing about it. I say two, it'll probably be two paragraphs. But um, Talib Kweli quoted a, jur- a journal of critical pedagogy, and he quoted Robin D'Angelo saying that white fragility is a state in which even a minimum, a small amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defense moves, meaning projection, really. These moves include the outward display of emotions such as anger, fear, guilt, and behavior such as argumentation, silence, and leaving the stress-inducing situation. Um, I find most rappers in general, this is black, Boricua, right? Black, brown, white. Um, they're Because they're all trying to make money from people that don't really appreciate the music at all and just might get stung by the addiction of a beat or the way the stylistic approach that an MC may have, they all have race fatigue. That's guaranteed. They all have race fatigue. You know what I mean? But um, as a gen- if I had to generalize. Um, but I'll say this. Here's my commentary. I find it hypocritical that a lot of these MCs, and I'm giving, du- I'm not going to say names, but these are direct personal experiences, so it could be anecdotal because I'm a journalist who's done it for, since 1994, Source, Vibe, XL, DX, shit, Hook.com, Matt, and Stress Magazine, magazines you don't know about, I was in. But it's okay to use my 5% Nation of Gods and Nerds dialogue, right, dialect, language, but if I go up to you and I say, listen, you use this wrong here, it actually means this. It's okay if you use it, but you used it wrong, then I get an attitude. I get a, you're a hater and you're being this and you're being that. Um, you wasn't there when I was learning. And then I, if I ask you who your teachers, I mean, if brothers really know what I'm doing in this 5%, they know how long I've been teaching it. Right? And if you go to a law school in Mecca, that's where you find me. I'm the oldest, the oldest, uh, the oldest teacher there at the school, 16 years going on. But if I if I go and I try to write, and I see that certain writers um, make a buzz for themselves, even make it into the New York Times because they sounded like Nas, and that's okay, and it's okay that they sounded like Nas, as long as you know that they're not Nas anymore, it's okay. This is what we call white privilege, and if that's not enough, I can make uh, insurmountable list of MCs and I'll name the MCs that I couldn't get in for with this other MC or rapper I should say Spit Gems Shazil York um, AG The Coroner countless others that had much work much buzz more buzz than who we're talking about Kevlar 7 Bronze Nazareth the whole Wiseman crew family right and um, I couldn't get him into certain big magazines because other guys were doing their had, they were rapping and they were also cooking, so it was more important. They had no catalog, but they were cooking. You know what I mean? And they sounded just like Ghost Didi, right? So it's okay, right? And I noticed today, this is the, the my final thought on this, about battle rap. These battles that we're seeing, though, they're not very well done. But what's worse about them is that they're not about one rapper bombing another about his hometown or maybe personal disses. They're being... They're, they're battle raps that are based on principles that shouldn't have been argued in the first place. There shouldn't be a battle rap about somebody biting. You see what I'm saying? There shouldn't be a battle rap about somebody else talking about white privilege when it's a very real thing within the industry. Especially since that white rapper Kwali has done songs with some of the worst white rappers in the universe. And he, did a, he did a song with Mac Miller. That should give him... He should be allowed to say anything about white people. He's letting him go, you know? Mac Miller. I always got on Sean P for that one. He never could explain it to me, you know? But um, that's all I have to say about that. But um, I'm glad that at Classic Storm Radio, whether I, or in this case, Toshi, invite the MCs and the artists and the producers that um, really are worthwhile. And with me, I have today brothers from Brooklyn. You know, I'm from Gunson Park, Brooklyn. I want to know where they're from in Brooklyn. But I have um, MC, MI, Mr. Impossible, and DJ yeah. Cut from Constant Deviance. Yeah. Man, peace to you, brothers, and I appreciate you sticking. 
by that long intro. I had a lot to oh, say on there. Man. No? That was good. Oh, that was good. Oh, 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 for real. You know, I, I don't want you to speak particularly about like, hey, white fragility is a thing. I saw a pussy white dude the other day and he couldn't fuck with us. You know what I mean? But um, my, my issue is this, is that the MCs of note, and this is really where I want to seg into you guys. MCs of note have been bypassed for a lot of shitty white rappers that give people the cliche they want to hear. So brothers like um, Zagnif Nori, who's killing them. Um, my brother Wooden Chain's out there, you know. Um, so many others, they're not getting any shine. And Constant Deviance, you guys been killing this decade. The last album, Avant Garde, though, I saw a great push, you know, by a publicist, but I didn't see the the, the amount of love that it should should have gotten, you know. And um, what do you guys feel about that in general? You know, the the, the place that you're in. I want to go through the catalog too, you know. Um, personally, like at this point in time, it's like kind of used to it by this point, you know. And um, it's really never been any difference. For us, we've been doing this since being quote unquote white was like, it was, I mean, I, I remember being in ciphers in the 90s and my teachers that taught me breath control and wordplay and lab tech one and my man one speaker supreme. Just sort of quick yes, correction, please. wanted to get that. No, it speaks, Because yes, I'm telling the story and these are local Baltimore dudes that people may be privy to but um they always told me like yo we want you to be dope not dope for being a white boy you mm. understand what i'm saying mm. like when we went to the ciphers because at that at that day and age in the early 90s it was hard to be a white dude walking into a cipher in a city like baltimore and getting accepted you were automatically going to be looked at like extra hard and it was a lot of 5% brothers that was rhyming back then. My man K. Rule, my man Ebony. You know that, that I had to, I had to like, I had to battle them actually because they came at me and we had to battle and then they respected me like, you, you bout it, like, you know what I'm saying? And it was always love. So that's not a new thing. And at this point, I'm not even sure if it's racial at this point for us that we're not getting the love. I'm not sure exactly what it is. I know it's mm. clickish, and I know the game is clickish now. And right, right. I'm Absolutely. starting to see. I mean, you know, there's all types of nationalities and races involved in the in the clicks. Mm. So you know, I'm, That's a good point, I can't man. necessarily say from my personal experience that I think it's a white and black, white and brown and black issue, or whatever you mm. want to say. Now we'll say this: going into the early 2000s, when me and Cut kind of took a little break from the constant deviance thing and I got a deal with Arista Mark Pitt signed me to Arista we just talked about this a little earlier today because of my skin complexion he wanted me to play off of that he would be like yo you alienate white people in your music you don't you know like we want you to kind of cater towards them and he wanted me to do just like some pre-sons of anarchy rock star hip-hop movement he wanted me to do like some some Hells Angels, Harley Davidson type thing. And just wasn't working. Like it wasn't going to work for me. Right. And he seen it wasn't going to work. So in turn, you know, that was... I used to tr tell him all the time, like, why do you think... This is the build off of what you were talking about. Why do you think all white people want a white rapper to come out and be a white rapper? Why can't he just be a rapper? And I don't alienate anybody. This is what I'm from. This is who I am. Like, I am who I am. If I do that, that's going to be me faking it. And I'm going to run out of things to say after one album. Because I don't know anything about that life. You understand what I'm saying? I don't know anything about riding Harley Davidsons and, 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 and cooking pigs or whatever the case may be. I don't know anything about that. So, you know, that's, that's what my mind is with it. You feel me? You know, and, th and that's the whole thing. If I had to say the race skews all of the, the, the MCs, every, almost every rapper, it ruins every rapper's ideas because if you're white, you have to do this cliche, frat boy type thing, whatever it is, whatever cliche people are expecting, you know? It's like um, it was 99 and I, and I was building with Fat Joe. I many times. I used to always run into Fat Joe, but I was doing it officially. 
and he was telling me when he first got on, they wanted him to be a freestyle rapper, and I was like, Fat Joe, do you even know how to sing? Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> Imagine Fat Joe doing like the steps like uh, K7 and TK That's and crazy. shit. That would have been ridiculous. You know what I mean? And he wasn't. He wasn't. Um. He wasn't older Pitbull like he is now. He didn't lose weight and just look like right. older Pitbull now, you know what I mean? He was still Joe the fat gangster. <laughs> yeah, exactly, you know? But um, those yeah. cliches really hurt. And um, I want to ask you, you guys came out in 95. So coming from Baltimore, I mean, if there's any place that we could say, look, let's name places that is just rugged and as rugged as New York, that would be one of them, you know what I mean? And coming from Baltimore and coming out with an album in 95, then you jump into the 2000s and have one album, right? What were the reasons for those gaps, though? And was it difficult once you made the album in, in 95? I mean, build on that and we'll build on that. I mean, the first album. All right. Um, you know, in, in 95, 96, 95 is when me and Cut basically started making started music. Making That's when we did a demo. One of the songs that was on the demo competition, Cat Speed, now it's got picked up by an indie mm. in uh, Vestry Records in New York. And um, that's when we dropped the first single. And during that little run with them is when we recorded an album, and that was Concrete Utopia. And then Ken, the, the, the one of the radio promoters from that label, ended up leaving and starting his own label, Brooklyn Pipeline, which was distributed by Buds. And... We recorded, we put out two more 12 inches, which is actually one of them right now he's playing, Can't Stop. And um, we put out two 12 inches with them in 98, 99, or 97, 98, whatever. It was right in that little time frame. They Both of them came out. And um, we recorded another album, thinking we were going to release another album. Then 99, 2000 is when the game kind of changed and... We just walked away from the constant deviance thing. Me and Cut still made music together, but we just kind of stepped away from the name just because everything was changing around us and it was like, I'm going to do the M.I. Cut thing rather than constant deviance. And um, that's when the deal with Arista came along with Mark. And it was a few years in that machine trying to really figure it out, trying to make something make sense. And uh, that took us to about like 2005, and that's when we started our independent thing. But even in that sense, we were still independent, trying to get on in the industry. Like, still trying to make something that made sense for the industry. And in about 2009, that's when One Speaker Supreme, the one I told you about earlier, one of the brothers that taught me how to actually rap not just write raps down and you know he taught me how to actually physically enunciate and verbalize what i was writing um he came to me and was like yo the music y'all put out in the 90s is popping overseas and all of that we should do something with it so we started releasing our music physically that's when we put out concrete utopia and amongst friends the two albums that we recorded back in the 90s and also the 1995 demo the actual first demo we ever recorded we put all of those out on vinyl so we never took a hiatus from making music it was just we didn't do the constant deviance thing and we were inside of the we were inside of the machine at that point so um so the machine kind of slowed us down for a while and you can lose five six seven years like like yeah, that in in, in it's, it seems like a lot to somebody like, oh, wow, the 90s feels like forever ago. And it's 2016 now, but we've been back doing it since 2009. Not doing it, but back. Now we release our music. Six to six records, we put everything out. So we went back and put out all of our archive music that was worth putting out. And in the process of doing that is when we began and started with Diamond, Avant Garde, and now Omerta. So we never stopped making music. Cut did a lot of work with a lot of artists in between that point. I worked with a lot of other producers during that time. We worked together. But stuff didn't see the light of day because we were in that machine at that time. That's piece that the destruction of the machine in the two, by the 2010s and seeing a renaissance, you guys would be added to a lot of great MCs and great producers that have finally seen the light of day in this decade. That's why I'm liking this decade more. I've always called the OOs the dark ages. So... I always try to uh, develop ammunition 
against the 2000s. You it know, was dark so ages many, for us, too. So <laughs> many great MCs were kept on the low, so many great artists, producers, and um, it stagnated the development, you know what I mean? But um, I want to talk about the Omerta album. We want to catch up to it, though. On Classic Storm Radio, DJ Toshi is taking us through the best songs that, well, the best songs played since the last time he was here. Right? Everything else you've heard though is not good enough. Unless you were one of our family, right? Right? Like DJ, you know, Bodega Cold Cuts always playing the ill shit. You know, there's a select bunch, you know what I mean? Um, that play the real shit. But we're here with Constant Deviant so and I have some questions for the brothers. I'm gonna say this about the Omerta album, right? And since I was telling the brothers that I was biased for the beats, I mean for the MC and the lyrics and stuff, we have to start with the MC and stuff. And um, one thing I've always liked about you, M.I., is, um, and I see it more overtly here, and the characters taken in the Omerta album, the Luciano character, and the storytelling. I love your tempos and inflections, you know? Like, you were talking about learning how to rap, but you don't just say this stuff. There's, there's, there's select pauses, there's select, you know, um, lengthening of words. You know, there's a subtle sarcasm in character, you know, in the character. And yeah, it's funny because there's a savagery in the character, right? And then a lot of times, though, we're like, yo, he's fucking savage. And then the chorus kind of drops the moral on a very subtle level. And then back to the character, and I just love that interplay. It was really good, and it never really hits you until, you know, you're repeating it. And then the repeats are coming from the addiction to the beats, you know what I mean? Some of the backdrops and everything like that, it's just a... Yo, got, you brothers made really a, a nice work here, you know what I mean? Thank you, thank you. A really thank nice you. work here, you know? Absolutely. But like, um, the first question is like, look, after all these albums and, and you finally release them, you get back on track, like really given the new material with Avant-Garde, right? Right. And then you just say, let's do a concept album. Like, where did this come about, you know? Um, this, this album in particular was actually, um... All right, so when we did Avant-Garde, and people are familiar with our music prior to that, like it's always, like you said, Avant-Garde was a little more laid back, it was a little more smooth. What we were really trying to do, and that comes from the title as well, is trying to merge the 90s sound with a more current sound and show that you can still make quote-unquote boom-bap underground rap music and sound current, where it doesn't sound like it was recorded in 1996 just because... Some people are stuck in 1996 where the music still sounds fresh and it still sounds like something like sonically and all, you know, everything. Like even the way they cut mixed it, cuts production, cuts sample, you know, sample selection on that album. It sounded newer and it sounded fresher, but it still had that feel from the 90s. And that's what we were trying to merge. And um, I think maybe a few people, like you said, it got that album got lost in, in a sense with some people. Because some people didn't really get where we were going with that. And maybe that'll be a sleeper album where five years from now people will go back and get it. But we initially started this album and it was just going to be the Luciano Lansky EP. And it was really just to do six joints that were hard just to let it be known that we hadn't softened up. We were just trying something different with that album. And we were going to just hit them with six joints behind Avant Garde real quick. And that's what it was going to be. It was actually inspired in Switzerland at a show that we did with Sean Price. And um, uh, it was just the feeling of the passion. night. Yeah, the feeling of that night just was like, it just was hard. It was like, yeah, man, we got to do some hard stuff. Him and his beats and all of that just live that night. It was like, because we were performing a lot of the avant-garde stuff that night as well. So it was just like, boom, we need to do something else right now just to get to it. As we started working on it, it just felt like it needed to be an album. And that's, Omerta was going to be one of the names of the songs, one of the songs on it. But then we were just like, now nah, let's call that the album. Let's call the album Omerta and give it this steam and make an album out of this. Because once we were six in, it was like, wow, we need to do another six, seven songs and do an album here. And it was already, like, we were already six in within like two months. So it was like, we knew we could knock it out quick and it would come quick enough. So, um, you know, that that is what inspired that album to go in that direction. Okay. Now, a, a lot of MCs always talk about getting the beat first and then 
they need to hear the beat before they rhyme though. So is, is it like that with you and DJ Cut? Like when you're making not, beats, Cut, how does it work out? You not, know, like not all, it, you know, we. It goes both ways. Sometimes he'll come to me and say, "I have an idea for for this joint. This is," and then, you know, he'll give me the feel or or, or something like that, and, and I'll try to you know cook something up. Right, right. Or sometimes I'll just be making beats and I and I hit him up like. I got this beat. I think it would be good if we did something like this, and then you know, and then he'll take it and build off of that. You know, it's not we don't have us. We work di we work differently every time, and and we could do that at this point almost because after just kind of working together for all these years, actually, you know, even starting off like when I first started really learning how to make beats, you know, and he and at that time like. He wasn't doing too much, to, you know. He was always rhyming, but you know, wasn't really a. No, we didn't have the studio. Many records at that yeah, point. we weren't really making records. It was like freestyle stuff like that, you know. Um, after so many years of kind of just building up together, we already kind of, we're already kind of in tune with what we want to do, you know. Yeah. Like, and now just to build off what you're saying, and yeah. and we release songs like. We got songs that we do that never make albums that might come out in between all the time. Like an album is a single entity in itself. So an album can be looked at like a song right. when we make an album. Like yeah, it's, it's so thirteen songs those thirteen songs. songs belong together. Right. That wouldn't be that album if it was twelve of them. It wouldn't have been an album if the one he just played, Cut for President, was on there instead of Spark Steakhouse, because that might not have fit the album the way that did. Like I said yesterday in the mm. interview, it's like taking a chapter out of a book and especially in the, in the middle, take chapter six out of a book and expect it to make sense still. Mm. You know, an album is an album. It's a complete body of work. So when we do that, we already came up with the concept. We already knew what direction we were going in. So by the time we were six songs in, we knew what the other, six all right, we, had to be. these oh, three yeah. need to be like this. Then you start toning it down and it's like, all right. Well, we got too many songs with pianos in them, so we need something that, or too many songs around this tempo, or too many songs about this topic, and you know, like, or we need another joint with some scratches on it. We need another joint with a vocal hook on it. Whatever, like, it, it's 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 a body of work. Mm. So you know, it's like, you know, an artist, like an artist could do a painting and then take a razor blade and cut it, and that's what made the piece of art so dope. They cut the face on the on the, something they just painted, and that's what makes it the the illest shit ever. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, you definitely see that. So, yeah. You know, and just for confirmation though, the um the actual DJ cuts are, are really strong. You know? I just, appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Really mm -hmm. strong, and they just come out right. And I just, on certain songs, I just like the choices. You know, like it's one of the things that that premiere always made people notice was the choices of who they decide to cut up. Right. You know, yeah, and so yeah. now, like with every record, I was like, who, who they decided to cut up though? And I just liked it though. I forgot what was the song where you were cutting up 50 and then you cut up another one, uh, Tupac. Tupac and then Jay Z. Um, yeah, yeah, and I just thought DeLorean. it was a, it's the, an the interesting DeLorean. combination of cuts. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? We spend, it, we spend a lot of time come. That's actually one of the things that we do mm -hmm. come back. Sometimes he'll come up with one on his own. And sometimes if I'm writing a song and I know the title of it, I'll be like, yo, let's use this. Okay. But okay. that's seldom. We really yeah. normally come back together in the studio and really yeah. just vibe out do things, and do yeah. those. Like, we yeah. really just sit there, listen to music, go over concepts. Like, we just zone out for days and just figure out what we're going to use for hooks. Because mm. we don't like using the obvious stuff. You know, the sequencing is something I was talking about, was thinking about with this and... Uh, Confirms what you guys told me because the re you know my favorite song was Spark Steakhouse and I felt as I was listening to the album I was delving deeper into these characters and that kind of seemed like a, a certain peak of like yo this is getting serious here you know what right, I mean right, right, right. and um there was a line here and I just want to see what you thought about the line what why you said that line you know and it's it's a it's a more of a it can't be like a right or wrong answer with the line, right. so it's more of a philosophical idea. But I just like what it said. It had me thinking, and I had to like, you know, just stop. Then I heard like the next three songs without listening to your lyrics because I was still thinking about that line. Right, right, you know right, what I right. mean? But I heard when you on Spark Steakhouse when you go, you never go broke when your fortune is hope. 
and I was just thinking about that line, you know, and I said, what made you say that line, though? Because, you know, we have all the, the, the albums going with these mafio, mafioso character that doesn't give a shit, but there was such a, a, a backbone of integrity that was underlying the whole thing, and it just, it, it peaked out more overtly in there, even though you was hiding it in a lot of metaphor right, right. and everything like that. And, you know, just your thoughts on that line, because I thought it was superb. I mean, thank you. Um, that line just, you know, I mean, it's it's the line itself is self-explanatory because mm -hmm. as long as you have hope and as long as you believe you can still do it, then you never run out of ideas. You never run out of, you know, you could take broke as a financial thing or you can take it as just, you know, you could take it that metaphorically as well. So we're not always talking about money. You understand what I'm saying? Like, when you're doing this, you never go broke. And... This whole entire album, even the Luciano Lansky metaphor in itself isn't us portraying ourselves as gangsters. Luciano and Lansky were the illest to ever do it. You know, I'm Italian, he's Russian Jewish. It made sense. And they were the illest to they were the illest gangsters ever. I mean they would have like you know, I mean, you know, every gangster since them has tried to be them again. And they were the epitome of what they did. You know what I'm saying? So that's the metaphor in the Luciano Lansky thing. You know, and, and that particular line, it just, you know, it it's what keeps us going. It's what keeps me going as a writer. It just, you know, it's like, I know as long as I believe I can still do this, and there's always a chance that maybe one more person, like this week in, in itself, we met... 40, 50 new people this week that knew our music that that I didn't know or have have never had a conversation that knew different songs. Everybody had a different favorite song. You're the first person this week to tell us Spark Steakhouse. And, okay. and that's awesome to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, that replenished the bank account in essence. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, right, that's, right, that's, right. that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one thing about... You DJ Cut yeah. is when you're making these beats, um, you kind of draw us into the world. This happened too when you listen to Avant Garde too many times, though. You kind of get into a zone listening to these albums. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it, it's an addictive quality. You know, and um, out of your beats, though, I think if I had to use the first word I think about is the crispiness of them. Right. You know, they're extremely crisp. You know, and. and you know, for a person that's not making beats and thinking about making beats or just want to know how the, what's your strategies in making them, what, what are you thinking about when you're making beats in general and de devising the character that you have on them? I mean, generally when I'm looking, you know, when I'm, when I'm trying to figure out what kind of... I rarely, like, just sit there and start banging. Uh, it's, it's, I always kind of go into it with, a, with more of a plan. Like, you know, I'll, I'll find a sample or I'll... I already have an idea. I was talking about this the other day. It's like everything. I look at everything like a like a soundtrack. Like what 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 music would I envision happening here for this kind of story or for what's going on here, you know? And then I'll and I'll go search that out, you know, and see and see what and what sticks, you know. So if it's like, you know, whether it be like a um, like a '70s Italian library record or or you know even some like 50s you know kind of swing kind of records or what 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 have you they all kind of music makes you feel a certain way you know so i, I try to find the, those things that are going to translate and then obviously just you know hard drums is is i love hard drums <laughs> so you know and you know the, the snares that'll make your eyes, you know, make you blink when you when they hit, you know, that that kind of stuff. And then as far as the the crispiness you were saying, I think that goes back to what we were saying. Like we don't want our records to sound like they were still recorded in the '90s. And also, I went, I spent money on school for engineering. Like mm -hmm. you know, I went, I was a, I was a professional engineer. I was in the studio for 20 years recording all kinds of stuff from, mm. you know, I, I, I worked I worked with Blue Note, recording jazz records, mm. I did speed metal records, I did all types of hip, hip hop records, I assisted on, you know, numerous 
you know, platinum records and things like that. I was, you know, you know so with was, that diversity, mm -hmm. you know, I don't find it an insult when people say I love the boom bap, but a lot of times boom bap is being defined by people that didn't love the music like that in the 90s, right. and they're just kind of categorizing music that they want to dismiss, you know, and um, I think it's unfair, you know, like there, there has to be new ways of defining what would what you guys are doing now, you know what I mean? Yeah, and and that's what we try to do. We try yeah, to give it, yeah. you know, I don't really, you know, I'm not I'm not going to say we're going to coin a new phrase for it, but right. we try to musically do it, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and I just want to mention, like, when you guys talk about this song, just because um, this, the, the, I have this song and two others I want to ask you about, just because they were my favorite songs on the album. We had the Spark Steakhouse. Another song that I have to ask you about was the, the and I just love the way, so many great MCs of this era have it, talked about the issue of police brutality and the cops and stuff. And I really like the subtlety and it, it's just subtlety that I like so much on the mic, you know? It's not overbearing. Thank you. And um, the way you did, the way you did Rainstorms, you know? And like the way you just told that story and it was matter of fact. And it's like, it made me think about like, you know, a lot of times even the hatred that some of these cops have is kind of like that's just their normal way like it's a normal way of doing things and we have all gotten used to certain levels of hate on all levels right. and that just struck me as something to right. think about when i was hearing that record you know thank you you yes. know that's a people man. yeah that that record that that record was a um it's funny because once again that's one of those records that if you get your mind all wrapped around or mad to luciano lansky and you get too wrapped up in that metaphor then you're wondering where that record makes sense and all of it. But it makes so much sense on the album, you know? It did to me and it, too, and, yeah. it, and it needed to be there. And it needed, the, the album needed something like that there mm -hmm. to make it complete. And um, I just wrote that, like, I wrote that song during the time when, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm from Baltimore. So I wrote that song during the time of the Freddie Gray riots, if that's what you want to call them, because it really wasn't. That much of a riot like they tried to say right. there was. Really protest. Right. Alright. You know, and, and just as a last note, my last song before you guys I want you know, Toshi's excited about you guys uh, burning one in the mic. Alright. But um the last song I really liked was Untitled. And I had no you know, even with the chorus, I thought you were gonna call the song clever. Right, 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 but you right, called right. it untitled and I right. was just curious why that was even the case. You know that was that was actually the name of the beat. That cut sent me when it was it was name untitled and I just felt like yo let's just call <laughs> let's this just one untitled that, though, yeah. you know yeah. like that, that to me was one of your better choruses it just was the way it was laid out it Thank grew you. where I was like wait a minute I like when the chorus goes in and I'm like wait is that the still in the verse right 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 ah oh, shit he's repeating it again it's actual right. chorus it's right shit, you know yeah, very Dope. yeah Thank you. very strong man you know but on that note because Toshi is a fiend. Yeah. <laughs> and and he's about to samurai me with yeah. the, with the tracks. Thanks, man, for you taking know? the time out to, to check us out, and also Absolutely. know that we are we also have a film company, and our first our first film, Six to Six, the movie, is going to be screening at um Ralph McDaniel's Hip Hop Film Festival oh, on August fifth. Really so we'll make piece. sure we'll make sure you get you know John get that you the info piece. for that. Yeah, and, uh, piece, so yeah. You come out and check it out. It you just have to love it, you know, and you have to. I mean, you know, you have to have a little bit of a business sense. We don't make a lot of money off of it, but it at least makes its money back to keep yeah. going. You know what I'm saying? And that's how we got into the film thing and the clothing thing and all of that because it gives us a chance to maybe generate a little more bread off of it, you know, gotcha. but, you know, it's cool. All right. So on that note, I just want to congratulate you on the great album. I want to thank, thank you for you. taking all these questions I had thrown at you and everything. It's... You know, much respect coming on DJ Toshi's shows and building with me, you know. Right. It's all coming really through. appreciate that. We, take, yeah. we thank you for taking the time to actually listen to the music and question, ask some deeper questions than, ask the, than where we met and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Word, that's, that's dope, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm sure they'll see that in some press by it. Right. All right. Am I on the mic? Yeah. I'm about to drop a freestyle. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, fasten up, I assassinate ducks, black trucks, AK, magazines, some gloves, and it's all out warfare, head for your fallout shelter, the heat from the beat might melt ya, y'all gas, too much seltzer, 
dude, I've been swerving on these fools. Mike, something nice, precise with your surgical tools. But I can't help you. Battle felt more like a burglary tomb. He lucky to just be in the emergency room. It's just another part of me. It's like the earth and the moon. Birth to the tomb. 66 shift. Had a crown before I even had a head in the womb. They know that it's a problem once the letters is moving And he running like a coward instead of improving 12 gauge rage, madman from the badland Baltimore murderland, stand down out of champ round Try to get up, but he can't now He getting tense cause he know he on my campground Don't make a damn sound, now you fam round clown Make my mans and them pull the fucking van round Get you laying down fools, this is personal Live, uncut, raw, no rehearsal I'm not the one to try to come up off I go sun up to sun down to sun up all We ever needed was a vein and a vision It wasn't just greed or vanity We was making a living And my word is bonds why it's hard to make a commitment When you out here you're worried about all that you can give them Uh, yeah 66 Alright, power equality, I lost see everything That was peace L's up, love and loyalty. Peace of the gods and earths. Peace of the low life family. Wherever we go, we have love and loyalty. We just had a great interview, a great conversation. You know, there's a science to this though. I was building on it with Toshi and Paragon, my brother from Premier Hip Hop. But I'm not gonna say shit about it. Because it's scientists that only scientists know that only certain people ought to have. You know what I mean? You wanna be like this, you gotta work at it. But we had these great guests. We had M.I. and DJ Cut of Constant Deviance. The new album is Omerta. Omerta. O-M-E-R-T-A. They're on 6 to 6 Records. That's 6, the, le- the number 2 in 6 Records. Um, it's a strong album. It's one of the stronger albums of this year. And it deserves a listen and it deserves a buy. All right? If, if anything else, that's the least amount of, of, of it deserves. You know? Them brothers is official, they got lots to say, and um, I think they got a lot more to say, you know, their career's just kicking off. But um, with all the issues, here's the final say. Hip hop is a culture by black and brown, meaning the original people. In stress situations, and like every single form of expression you see today artistically done and manipulated by, by us, by them, it's for the world. It's for the world to enjoy, and it's for the world to progress, and it's for the world to also engage in. But they have to engage in with that grit and that spirit. And since times aren't good, then this music better be good. You know, and if it's not, then it's no, it's no, it has no place to belong. You know, and some of these contradictions and hypocrisies are what I was trying to draw out today. And what, you know, this whole quality situation, what this whole Puerto Rico colonial situation brings out. There are contradictions in this world that we accept. But when they border and they dive into hypocrisies is when we must speak out. And when we speak out, we have to use the art forms, the only things that we have left, the only forums that we have left are these art forms. So we gotta respect it and we gotta uphold it. And DJ Toshi has been one of them though, who sacrifices life, limb, you know, and uh, has restructured his whole domicile to be hip hop. You gotta respect that shit. You gotta love it. There are certain people that belong in this hip hop. And there are certain people that earn their way in this hip hop. Tonight we had guests that definitely have earned and deserved their place in it. So on that note, I wanna say peace. Peace to DJ Toshi, peace to Paragon, and peace to my whole family. Peace. Y'all take it easy, bye-bye.